Okay. Well, we're in the book of Haggai. Okay, so open up there. If you're not sure where that is or you've forgotten, it's almost at the end of the Old Testament. It's between Zephaniah and Zechariah. So Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. If you get to Matthew, you've gone too far and you're just running ahead of me and God, apparently. So you need to... <laughs> we don't want to miss any bit of this. So the book of Haggai. And um, Haggai, uh, remember we said that Zephaniah was the last of the pre-exilic prophets, referring to uh, that season of time where the Lord was speaking to his people just before the Babylonian captivity. And Haggai is the first of the three post-exilic prophets, so meaning after the exile, they had come back into the land, and, um, and he prophesied to the people who had returned from exile. And uh, you remember in 536 B.C., uh, not that we remember those kind of dates typically, but you Bible students of Bible history, you may remember that Cyrus the king of Persia issued a decree and it allowed the Jews to go back to the land in Zerubbabel, um, led about 50,000 people back into Jerusalem for the purpose of rebuilding uh, the temple. And, and there was a whole lot of opposition as they came back in the land to do that, as is true of any work of the Lord and any leading of God, there's always going to be the enemy there. Uh, we know today about the world, the flesh, and the devil, right? And this is our enemy. These are our enemies. And, and it was the same was true as back then, but there was a very uh, real uh, physical persecution and resistance as they came back into the land, and it was discouraging, and the people were tempted to give up and not do what God told them to do. And, and, it, and it, so this is a really important book. It has very practical implications for our lives because God has a work that he's doing in and through your life to this day. And, and sometimes we get tired. Do anybody get, does anybody else get tired? You feel spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally just drained. That's why we have a midweek service, folks. Because <laughs> we get tired, you know, and we just need to come back together as God's peeps. And remember some of the things that he's told us. And so... Same for them. And so Haggai was challenging, challenging the people to get back to work and finish the building of the house of the Lord. And in fact, he even had to get tough with them. I, I love this about the prophets and, and how you see that balance in at least some of them. They were tough and tender. And I think that's the way God is. I know that's the way God is. As my dear brother Gary Thomas likes to say, God is as gentle as possible and as firm as necessary. And uh, that's a that's a Garyism. I like it. I, I use it all the time. And uh, when he goes home to be with the Lord, I'm just going to claim it for myself, and you and nobody will know. I'll, they'll just think I'm really wise. And uh, well, anyway, uh, so it, he had that tough but tender quality. And and on the one hand, he had to chastise people, and on the other hand, he wanted to encourage people. Because there were those that were faithful to the work, and they, they continued in the work of the Lord. And, and so there's always that reality among the people of God. There are those that, you know, are, are kind of losing heart and giving up, and they're discouraged and distracted, and they, they just stopped, you know. And uh, they need a little loving kick in the pants, and God knows how to do that. And sometimes it's through the, a word of prophecy. And, and sometimes the word of God comes into our lives. It may be through a friend, a brother or sister, or, uh, sometimes even through a perfect stranger, you know. The Lord has His ways of speaking to us. And the reason is because we can, we can neglect the importance of God's Word and His call in our lives. We need to be reminded on a regular basis, at least I do, uh, to, to keep the Lord in the center and His purpose in the center because my circumstances can be distracting to me when they're hard. And, um, and so Haggai's exhortation really helped. We will see the people did get back to work. And they did finish the temple. G. Campbell Morgan said this. I, I think it's um, just an interesting little anecdote. He said, whereas the house of God today is no longer material but spiritual, the material is still a very real symbol of the spiritual. 
And when the church of God in any place, in any locality, is careless about the material place of the assembly, the place of its worship and its work, it is a sign and evidence that its life is at a low ebb. And you know, I, I, I like that. I haven't thought about that in a while. I, I think we tend to emphasize that this, you know, this is just a building, right? We're the temple of the Lord today. But let's not swing to the other extreme where we're not being thoughtful, grateful, careful stewards of what God gives us. You know, and uh, this is one of the reasons why we're, um, we're saving money and we're, we're drawing up plans and we're moving to try to get permits to, to do some remodeling in the church. It's, it's not because, you know, we want to be frivolous with, you know, with things. It's just that, you know, after about 20 years, things get tired looking and <laughs> we want to kind of freshen things up a little bit. And, and, and so from time to time we do that. And I just think that's a part of good stewardship. I think it's part of loving people well when we're always rethinking, okay, how are we using our spaces? Aren't you guys thankful for this fellowship hall? Yes. It's a beautiful space. And I remember when it just used to be an old basketball court surrounded by trees. And it was just tired and, you know, the basketball court didn't get used very much and the church was growing and we needed the space and, you know, we could have just thrown up an old shack and called it good, but, you know, God used gifted people. Artistic, creative, talented people. And we, we did something, I don't think it's ostentatious by any means, but it's nice. And it's a space that we like to be in. And, and it's the same all over this building, you know. And, and um, so we don't want to be distracted by these things or, you know, go overboard with this. But I, I do think that in a way it reflects, uh, you know, our, our thinking and in, in, in a spiritual sense. Uh, when we when we use the things God gives us in a in a way to bless others, and I think it's part of loving well. Well, <clears throat> uh, in this book, we're going to see in the first part that uh, Haggai is rebuking the people. He's calling them to repentance, and then at the in the latter part of the book, he's encouraging them as they begin to obey the Lord and get back to work and get back to the the work of the temple. And, and there's this great balance that I think is so necessary for ministry of, of confronting people in their sin, but also encouraging them for their obedience and, and the work that they're doing. And, and I think it's, it's unfortunate, but, um, you know, it's easy in ministry for people to kind of uh, get beat up for their sins on the one hand, and then maybe on the other hand to just give a lot of sort of warm, fuzzy encouragement without real honest confrontation, you know. And, and I just really, I, I, I just appreciate all the more in my life as the years go by how the Lord does both. Sometimes He just kind of deals with me and in a firm way, and other times He just knows how to come along and encourage. And, and uh, so I think this book, as we go through it, if the Lord has some words of correction for you, don't, don't, you know, don't get your feelings hurt. How many of you realize God doesn't really care that much about hurting our feelings? <laughs> Uh, he doesn't want to, you know, make us feel beat up, but sometimes he, you know, he just says it the way it needs to be said. But he's always, it's always with a heart of love and mercy, and, and he prefers to be gentle, but sometimes he is, he is firm. Well, in this message, there's a few little things, if you're going to note taker. Uh, he first of all calls them to be honest. Um, and you'll see that as we get started here. And, and just to, to put God's um, house ahead of their houses. We're going to see some real practical application in our own lives because we can, we can you know, uh, be living our lives, putting a lot of our resources into our own stuff and, and little to nothing into God's stuff. And, and so he wants, he wants people to be honest about that. And I would encourage you to be honest about that too. He also appeals to them to be strong when we get into chapter 2 and to be clean. And, you know, in the Lord's work, we, we've got to be strong. Because there's, again, one of the ways the, the enemy does what he does is we just get discouraged and, and we are weak. And sometimes we need, you know, Joshua was really good at this. He, he told the people, be strong and courageous, you know. And I think we need that reminder. And, and Hekia does that. 
But there's a sense in also which he realizes that part of the issue, part of where they've gone off the rails, is, is they just don't live holy lives anymore. They don't live consecrated lives. All of their lives aren't being set apart for the purpose and work and glory of God. They were holding back most of their lives. And they were focused on just their own comforts and their own happiness and their own selfishness. And, and he says, hey, we need to clean some things up. And the idea is we've, we've become defiled by materialism and worldliness. And, and we're not holy. Holy, the idea of holiness isn't just pure and sinless. and It's, it's also set apart and consecrated to God. Our priorities are right. And then, and then he, he, he says, be encouraged. And that's the way he wraps it all up. And, um, and so let's dive into this. First thing is be honest. We're going to read the first uh, four verses. <clears throat> in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says... The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Kind of a rhetorical question of sorts. I guess he's not really asking a question. He's making a statement. He's saying, is this really the time to be focused on you? Or should we be focused on the Lord? But notice the detail. The second year, and the sixth month, and the first day of the month. And, and so this work of the Lord had bogged down, and they got distracted. And many, many years had gone by. I think something like 14 years or 18 years or something like that. It just kind of came to a halt. And you know, delayed obedience is disobedience. And God keeps track and counts the days of our delays. I think that's really important to realize. Is there something in your life, an area of your life, where you're just dragging your feet and you've gotten used to sort of delayed obedience? But in the back of your mind, you know the Lord's saying, do it. Get it done. And even though you may have gotten used to this, God is keeping track. And it's interesting how the, the Babylonian captivity it's, itself was evidence that God was keeping track of the days. Because remember, he had told them things like, you need to have a day of rest, a Sabbath day. You need to let the, life, the ground lie foul. And they ignored it, and they ignored it, and they ignored it. And finally, God tallied up the tab, and he said, all right, 70 years in captivity. If you're not going to let the land rest, I will. I'm going to remove you from the land and just let my land rest. And in the process, I'm going to teach you. A lesson, you see? And so, I, I think, you know, you can read over stuff like that. And go, well, it's just date. It's just kind of count. What does that all mean? You know, six month, first day. It, let it, <laughs> make a note of it. God cares about the details and the days of our lives. Because, you know, those that time can mark how, how disobedient we are sometimes. I think if Haggai could have used a New Testament text for his sermon, it may have been something like Matthew 6, 22. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. That's Matthew 6, 33. And, and he's saying, hey, are you thinking about the things of the kingdom, or are you thinking about your kingdom? And um, they're saying the time has not yet come, and God's saying, no, I think it has you go back to the to the uh, book of Ezra when the when the temple was originally built. It had an amazing, glorious start. Listen to this in Ezra three ten. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But in spite of this glorious beginning, after two years the work stopped. And, and it, again, it became just, they became discouraged and distracted. They didn't stay focused. And so Haggai comes along 
And, and he says, all right, let's get going. And, um, you know, you wonder, why, how does this happen? Why would they be so blatantly disobedient? Well, you know, I don't want to be too hard on them because, I mean, I'm not saying we want to excuse it any more than we want to excuse our own sin. But, you know, I, I'm learning to, to be careful not to judge too harshly the people, the examples in the Bible of people that blow it. Because I blow it all the time. And, and, I, and, I, and I imagine, you know, what it must have been like to be in their sandals. You go back into the land, everything's total rubble. Man, I could get discouraged when I just go into my daughter's bedroom. And I, I, where do we begin, you know? And, and so you, you think about her. Sometimes, you know, uh, we've always had dogs. And I, I go a bit in the backyard, and it's just miles and miles of little brown piles. And I, I, I don't know where to begin. And I, I think to myself, how discouraging it must have been for these people. And, 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 you know, after 70 years to come back into the land. And it was hard work. Have you ever been over there to the, to, to the, to the Holy Land? Have you ever looked at the stones at the Temple Mount? Some of them are as big as city buses. And, and not a stone was left unturned when it was destroyed. I mean, you just, you look at that, you go, I get tired just thinking about it. Like, how do they even, I mean, those are some big rocks, man. Uh, so I, I, you know, and they didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have a lot of manpower. There was famine. Their crops were failing. They had enemies resisting them at every turn. And you think about this in your own life, and sometimes you get overwhelmed. You know, and, and all of a sudden, it's just like the children of Israel, how they wanted to go back to Egypt, and you're thinking, are you crazy? 430 years of slavery? And they're going, yeah, but at least, you know, at least we had this, and we had that, and we had food, and we had houses, and yeah, they beat the heck out of us, but at least, you know, we kind of, you know, we got used to it, and we could live. Now we're wandering out in this God-forsaken desert, you know, and and just think of your own life and how easy it is to get discouraged. But does God change the command and say, well, okay, I guess we don't really need to do anything. <laughs> There's no work of the Lord. There's nothing I want to do of really any significance in this world in and through your life. I guess we'll just kind of shelf that idea. No, no, no. God says, no, we're, we're, we're going to do this. It's just that you're going to have to de depend on God. It's only going to get done by the power and the grace of God. And guess what? You're going to have to trust Him. And you're going to have to obey. And you're going to have to put one foot in front of the other. And don't let hurt or fear be an excuse for a bad attitude or disobedience or unbelief. God has compassion for, for our hurts and our fears. Of course He does. But that's, that's not ever an excuse for delayed obedience or disobedience, right? And, and, and so, you know, they, so they, made, they made their excuses sound spiritual, just like we can. And, but they couldn't really speak against the idea of building the temple, so they just spoke against the timing. It's not really the time. You ever do that? Well, I know I need to do that, but, you know, it's just not the time right now. I got these other things that are more pressing. God says, hey, uh, be careful. It seems like... It's never the time to sacrifice to do the Lord's work. But it's always the time to do something for me. It's always the time to... It, it, I mean, I'm seeing some heads nod. I agree. I'm so glad I'm not alone. <laughs> and, and it really does come down to priorities. We need to be honest with ourselves regarding what we truly value. Where does our time and our energy and our money and our talent... Where does it all go? We have a limited supply of each of those things, you understand? What are we doing with what God has given us? And will those things last eternally? Will they glorify God? Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 10? He said, because of God's grace to me, I've laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever's building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have. Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, 
jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on Judgment Day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. If that work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. It, it, it's, it's hard truth to hear, but it's really, it's sort of like, sort of like an alarm clock, unwelcome but necessary. <laughs> I think of, of these kind of scriptures like I don't want to hear it and yet I need to hear it. Otherwise I'll just waste my life. I'll sleep through everything good that God's trying to do. So to speak. In a parable about a wise and foolish steward, Jesus said this in Luke 12, 48, For everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. Hey Darren, are you able to see any of those slides like Luke 12, 48? No. <laughs> okay, sorry. We're working out some technical difficulties. The little slides are tiny. So Anyway, uh, Paul echoed this sentiment when he said, 1 Corinthians 4, 12, Now a person who is put in charge as a manager must be faithful. And then Matthew 6, 19 to 21, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal Store your treasures in heaven, for moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And so Paul is, or, or in Haggai, much the same way, he's, he's wanting us to be honest with our spiritual priorities and line them up with God's priorities. Why? Because souls depend on this, and, and also God wants us to experience his best, his eternal blessings. And so he's saying, be honest. Consider your priorities. The next thing he wants us to think about is, what the, these people to think about is, is to realize why they're facing such adversities. In verses 5 through 11, he talks about their adversities. He says, uh, now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, verse 5, consider your ways. You've sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus, the Lord of hosts says, consider your ways. Do you ever feel like the Lord says that to you? Hey, think about where you're going. Think about what you're doing. Think about the way you're thinking. It's important to think about our thinking. Because our thinking translates into living. What we believe determines how we behave. And so we need to consider our ways. And he was pointing out they hadn't been fruitful. And so as a result, adversity was now their reality. And they had spent all this time and effort building and decorating their own houses, but they neglected the house of God. Their priorities were upside down. And I think it's important to realize if, if you won't tell yourself the truth, God will. He will. He'll tell you the truth. And, and these judgments are a fulfillment of the promises that he made actually hundreds of years before in the time of Moses. Remember when God gave the, the commandments and Moses addressed the nation and he said, here's what God expects in Exodus 20 and he, he lined it all out for them. And he said, basically, if you obey, I'll bless you. If you disobey, uh, you're going to be chastened. And sometimes it's out when our priorities are out of order, uh, he brings a little adversity into our lives. And it's tempting to, to blame the devil for everything, and sometimes God says, no, don't give him credit for that. I've actually allowed some adversity into your life because you're not being a good steward of what I've given you. And so I'm allowing some hardship. Now, now listen, I'm not saying that's always what God is doing. I'm not saying that the enemy never is in the mix. Often it is kind of a mixture of both. What God's doing, the enemy's also trying to confuse us as to why God's doing what he's doing. And so, um, but, but we've got to have the right priorities. And, um, and, and sometimes he's saying, look, you know what? More attention needs to be to the Lord's work. I have to say this, though. God's love and, and salvation is never conditional on, you know, like what we do to earn it. 
But his blessings are conditional. And we have to trust and obey his word or we miss out on his blessings. I remember telling my kids when they were little, if they were being ornery or naughty in some way, when they were being foolish or selfish or mean or ungrateful, you know, at dinner time, you know how, <laughs> it's pretty predictable with little kids. There's, there's the morning routine, there's the meal routine, there's the bedtime routine, there's the chore routine. Anytime you're telling them to do something they don't want to do, it's very predictable. You just know that there's going to be certain, you know, shenanigans that they try and, and to get away with. And uh, I, you know, if my kids were acting up at the table, I would just, I'd, I'd say, you know what, it's time for you to take a break. I want you to go sit down over there. And it'd always be kind of nearby where they could uh, hear the conversation and they could smell the food. <laughs> you know, and fellowship and hunger can be great motivators. And, and, and they're listening in. Now, I never, I wasn't harsh about it, and I, I never separated them from my love. But I did separate them from blessings sometimes. And I would tell them, look, if you want to enjoy the blessings of this family, then you need to abide by the rules and principles that make this family work. And, you know, it takes a lifetime to learn that stuff. But I think God does that with us, too. I think sometimes He sets us on the sideline a little bit. And we miss out on some of the blessings. And He still loves you just as much as He's ever loved you. He's crazy about you. That's why He's disciplining you sometimes. And He's saying, look, you know, God doesn't love me. You know, you hate me, don't you? You know, <laughs> He's saying, no, I love you. I do. But... If you want to enjoy the blessings of the life that I have for you, then you got to abide by the rules that I've outlined to make life work. It only works the way I've designed it to work. And if it isn't working, it's because you're trying to do it your way. And um, so he says, consider your ways. And then we get to verse 8. He says, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, it blew away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land, and the mountains, on the grain, and the new wine, and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. It's interesting how we call certain things, you know, acts of God. You know, when these big natural disasters, it's an act of God. And uh, sometimes it really, it truly is. And uh, he says, go up to the mountains and bring wood. So he's calling them to work. And sometimes, you know, what God's up to needs work. Yes, it's supported by prayer, but it also takes People rolling up their sleeves and getting involved and doing the work. Be careful that you're not one of those people that are just constantly saying, well, I'll pray for you. I'll pray about that, brother. <laughs> Meanwhile, your brother's going, but I need help now. <laughs> you know, and, and we don't withhold good from those to whom it is due, the Bible says. There's times when we just, you know, there's sacrifice involved. There's work that needs to be done. And it's, it's you know... Again, it's like so many things in life, the most meaningful things. You know, it's inconvenient. We don't always feel like doing the hard work that parenting requires, the hard work that marriage requires, the hard work that any ministry requires. Relationships require sacrificial love and hard work. And, and too often people are, are just walking away from that area of ministry in their life. Say, I don't want to do the work. I'm tired. He says, hey, it's time to work. You got to work at this. I'll supply the grace, I'll supply all the strength, and I'll supply all the wisdom. I'll give you everything you need for life and godliness. But you have to do the work. You cannot do what only God can do. He will not do what you ought to do. It's, it's, he works together with us. And, and don't think, well, somebody else will do it. God wants to use you to do it. And so the Lord actually called a drought on the land. And, and Haggai is saying, hey, be honest. Be honest about your priorities and uh, be honest about why you're in the trouble you're in, your adversities. And, and now we're going to look at sort of a picture of ministries 
the, the different ways that people respond and are responsible before the Lord to, to minister and to do their part. Verse 12, Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people. Here we go. So turn in the right direction. What's it say? Obey the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai the Lord's messenger spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. And so God used his word to get both the leadership and the people moving. This is why, by the way, y'all are here right now. This is why I'm here right now. This is why sort of the main staple and, and the foundation of, of God's work at Calvary Chapel is always going to be the whole counsel of God's Word. Because it's the Word of God that keeps us on task. It's the Word of God that, you know, like, like Paul talked about, it's profitable, it's useful for things. It's useful for correction and rebuke and instruction and training in righteousness. It's the Word of God that does that. We forget things. We get confused about things. We're easily deceived and distracted. It's the Word, it's the Word, it's the Word. And this is what God's doing through Haggai the prophet. He's given them the Word. And that's what got them up and got them moving. And they started to obey again and do the work of the Lord. And immediately, notice, He comes along and affirm, affirms them. You know, I've seen some parents with their kids, and their kids are just withering under their parents' instruction this one because it's, they're just so critical. And, and the kids can never do enough to please them. It's really important as parents, as grandparents, it's really important as faithful, godly friends that, that we, we're, you know, yes, there's a time of correction. Yes, there's a time for rebuke. Yes, there's a time to go and speak the truth in love. But the thing I love about the Lord is the minute that we start moving in the right direction, he comes along and he says, Had a boy. He just encourages you. We got a new puppy, some of you have seen on Facebook. She's not saved yet. <laughs> <laughs> so we're training her. And she needs it. She's a super smart little thing. She's a, what is she? Australian Labradoodle. We're supposed to be just as smart as whips, you know. She's also stubborn. Oh, I think she's part donkey. And see, and so, you know, I, I've got a trainer. And, uh, but here's the thing. I found, you know, the minute she does something right, I'm like, oh, you, 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 good boy, you, you know, and I'm just, just loving on her and, and, you know, just hugging her and petting her and giving her treats, you know, and she's just like, you know, it's, she needs that. If I just am always hard on her, she's going to become... She's just going to run. She's going to hide. She's going to run. She won't come. You know how it is? It's the way people are. If, if you know, you know how you've heard of a foot-shy dog? Because it has a master that's just yelling and abusive and always kicking them and, you know, angry. and That dog may behave sometimes, but it's only out of fear. And, and I think this is the way God is with us. It's just, sometimes he's firm, but he's never harsh. He's never mean. And, and he's just, as soon as we do the right thing, he just, by the Spirit of the Lord, he has it through his word, he comes along, he encourages us. He says, yes, honey, good job. So proud of you. So pleased with you. And I, I love this. They start to do the work. And, you know, and, 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 and I, I, I came across this quote from Chuck Smith, and I, I think it's so good. He said, how can you tell if a church is being stirred in their spirit? How can you tell if a body of believers is really spiritual? They get to work on the things of the Lord. They want to volunteer to help out. You don't have to beg or coerce them. They're just driven by God to serve. Isn't that true? I love what Paul said. He said, the love of Christ constrains me. You know, why did he do what he did? Hey, he could have had a much cushier, easier life. 
He was a brilliant man. He was probably a wealthy man, at least at one time. He was a powerful, influential man. He had all the perks, all the benefits, all the status a person could ever want. And he gave it up to serve the Lord. And he suffered a lot. Why did he do it? He was constrained. He was absolutely compelled by the love of Jesus for people. It's the way we want this church to be. I hope you never feel beat up or like I'm just kind of cracking the whip or come on you guys, get going, you know. We, we let you know constantly about opportunities. We let you know about needs. We, we just put it before you. There's no obligation to do anything. But there's always an invitation. And you can never outgive God. You'll never be able to outgive God. In fact, I challenge you, I encourage you, try. <laughs> just try. You'll just be doubly blessed. God will exponentially bless you. I don't care what, I'm not talking just about in, in material things or, or, or monetarily. Just, you try to outgive God with your time and your love and your talents and your treasure. Just, just give it to the Lord and see what happens. And, and you, will, you will have such an abundance, as Jesus said, it's just like pressed down, shaken, and overflowing, and you just, you just can't outgive God. And so the Lord here is encouraging the people as they began to obey and hey guys saying, hey, this is what I'm talking about. And uh, do we have that kind of attitude? The Lord stirred up the spirit and they came and worked on the house of the Lord. And, and they had a new fear of the Lord. They had a new reverence for the things of God. They had a new love for God and for the house of God and the work of God and the people of God. Do you think that way? I hope you do. We come into chapter 2 and there's three messages. And I'll speed, speed up as we kind of finish out here. Three messages are presented in chapter 2. Uh, he says, In the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of people, saying, Who's left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now, be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. And be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am, what? With you. I'm with you. I love that says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. So remember your history, folks. And he says, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it's a little while, I'll shake heaven and earth, the sea of dry land, and I will shake all the nations. They shall come to the desire of all nations, and I'll fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple, temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. And so the times were hard, the people were poor, the leaders were discouraged. And this restored temple was going to be nothing like the temple of Solomon. And so you can just imagine the people wondering, is this really worth it? <laughs> I mean, Solomon's temple was pretty glorious. People came from all over the world, and they could see it from miles and miles away. I mean, it just shined like a city on a hill. I mean, it really, truly was a city on a hill. But I mean, it, it just was a blaze of glory, of marble and gold. and It was just a beautiful thing to behold. The people did not realize what the prophet was really getting at that would be fulfilled in their day in a very small sense, but later in the future it was going to be revealed as the glory of the Lord himself. Just like the good old days when the glory of the Lord came in and filled the temple. There was going to come a day in the future where Jesus himself was going to go into the temple. Remember that? And it's going to be that way in the end of days. And so again, this prophecy, there's sort of an, uh, an early and, and, and latter fulfillment. But the people, if you go back to Ezra chapter 3, and we don't have time to turn there, but I'll just read it to you in verse 12. It describes the people who had seen the first temple and, 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 and what it felt like just 16 years before this prophecy of Haggai when the work of the rebuilding of it began. 
Listen to what Ezra writes. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the fathers' houses, old men who'd seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy for the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the sound was heard far off. And so here's what's going on. The older generation is watching the new temple be built and they're really sad because they're remembering the good old days and they're going, are you kidding me? This is nothing like the good old days. And the new people are excited for the new work of the Lord. And um, I remember Chuck Smith talking about this because he dealt with this a lot. Chuck Smith was the founder of the Calvary Chapel movement. So back in the 60s, and it just, God ex just sort of did this great revival. And they were baptizing hundreds of thousands of people uh, on a regular basis down there in Corona Del Mar, Pirates Cove, and down there in Southern California. And, and I don't know if some of you may remember, even they, they was, it was such a phenomenon, uh, part of the Jesus movement and this great uh, revival, that it was actually written up in Life magazine. There's photos in Life magazine of the Calvary Chapel movement. And so what has happened over the years is people remember those good old days. I've had so many people over the years come to this church and tell me, I was back under the big circus tent, you know, because they couldn't fit in the building, so they brought in the big circus tent, and they'd have thousands of people in the circus tent. You know, they could do that in Southern California, a little better weather than us. But, um, and, uh, but Chuck said this of those days. He said, the older we get, the more we seem to think that yesterday was the best, and nothing today can compare. And then he says, God is not nostalgic. I love that. And we shouldn't be either. I hear people talk about back in the tent days or back in the Jesus movement. I don't want to look back. This is Chuck talking. Those were great times, but these are great times too. Ultimately, everything will burn and we will be in the presence of the Lord. And those will be the days. Let's look forward, not backward. Isn't that great? You know, it's so true how we can tend to look back for the good old days and pine away from that and we miss what God's doing today. Guess what? Jesus is still moving. Amen? Amen? And so, he says, Be strong and work and do not fear. And that was how this great work of God um, came to pass. <clears throat> what is it that he means by this desire of all nations? It's, it's, it's prophetic of a coming day of the Lord, when Jesus would come. And I just wrote a little note to myself. Knowing that Jesus is the desire of all nations ought to encourage our missionary work as we desire Him for all nations. Do you think like that? That's our great commission, is to make disciples of all the nations. Every ethnic group. Doesn't mean you have to go to every nation. Sometimes God brings the nations to us. Some of you may live next door, literally, to people who are from other countries. And, and they may not know it, but Jesus is the desire of the nations. One day, every people tribe to Ignatius is going to be bowing before him and calling him Lord and worshiping at his throne. We know that, but there's a whole lot of people that don't yet know that. And we should desire him for all the nations. And, uh, okay, then he says, so he says, be strong. And then he says, be clean. Notice he says, on the 24th day of the ninth month and second year, Darius, the word of the Lord, came by Haggai the prophet, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil or any food, will it become holy? And the priest answered and said, No. And Haggai said, If one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? So the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. And Haggai answered and said, Listen, so is this people. And so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. So what's going on here? Well, Haggai question, he asked them these questions. And, but it's, the idea is, uh, can, can holiness and impurity be passed on? And they answered correctly, according to the law of Moses. It's interesting. Think about this. Holiness is not contagious. But impurity is. I mean, 
we all understand that, how do we say in, in, in what's the, the old adage, uh, uh, a rotten apple spoils the bunch. Right? It doesn't make all the other apples better. Um, a sick child cannot catch health from contacting a healthy child, but a healthy child can become sick. And that's essentially what he's saying to the people. And he's saying, look, you've come back into the Holy Land and you're offering sacrifices, but it's, it's not going to make you acceptable if at the same time you're neglecting the work of the Lord. If you're, in other words, if your heart isn't right before me and you're not walking in obedience and doing what I'm telling you to do, all the religious motions you're going through in the name of God, it doesn't mean anything to God. You understand? This translates into our lives just as relevantly today. We can go through all these religious motions and go to church on a regular basis and, and even serve in ministry and do different things, but if our heart isn't in the right place, it doesn't mean anything to God. And so he's telling them, you need to get back to the right focus. So the priests couldn't share holiness, but they could spread sin, and that was the cancer that was in their midst at this time. Verse 15, And now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days when one came to a heap of twenty ephahs, there were but ten. But when one came to a wine vat to draw fifty baths from the press, there were but twenty. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail in all your labors of your hands. Yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? And yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day I will bless you. It's interesting to me that God wants to save us more than we want to be saved, and He wants to bless us more than we want to be blessed. It's, it's really true. The people had been defiled, and God would not bless them. But He's saying, look, now that you've turned to me, I promise a blessing. I will make you clean, and I will bless your life. What is it that makes us clean before God? Well, the Bible says it's the blood of Jesus. Do you remember? How about this scripture? 1 John 1, 5 through 9. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light and there's no darkness in him at all. So we're lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We're not practicing truth. But if we're living in the light as God's in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And here it is, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. That's what these people were doing. They could do the same thing. But here's what he wants you to know. If we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. But again, if we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing his word has no place in our hearts. Does God's word have a place in your heart? Can God tell you the truth? If he can, that means when he calls out your sin, you're not going to run and hide. You're going to say, Lord, I want you to expose my heart because I don't want to be a slave to sin anymore. I want to be walking in freedom and in the light and experience fresh cleansing from you. Hebrews 1.3 is a fascinating verse to me. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. Listen carefully. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This word cleansed is an interesting word in the Greek language. It's the word kathar, katharismos. Katharismos, I think is how you say it. Katharismos. doesn't matter how you say it, but, the, but the, the root is interesting to me. It's where we get our English word catharsis. Exactly. You say, so catharsis like... Here's what cathartic means. So let's say you go you go to a therapist, and 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 maybe you're there in a chair, you're laying on the couch, uh, as we see in the movies, uh, and and they say, okay, I just I just got to get this off my chest, and, and it was, it's, it's a cathartic it's a cathartic if I just kind of ah, just kind of gets everything off your chest. They call it talk therapy, right? <clears throat> Here's what the Bible says: the only thing that has the power to get anything off of your chest and to purge and cleanse your guilty conscience and take away all of your shame. The only thing that has 
that can do the heavy lifting to take those burdens, spiritual, mental, emotional, it's the blood of Jesus. Amen. That's the only thing. Talk therapy won't do it. Drugs won't do it. I hope I'm not hurting anybody's feelings here. I'm cutting it straight. I'm telling you what God's word says. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses a man from all sin. But he always connects that with walking in the light. You're going to continue to feel shame. You'll continue to feel guilt. You'll continue to feel burdened by sin if you walk in darkness and you lie to yourself and you don't practice the truth. The minute you step into the light and you say, Lord, tell me again the story of the cross. Tell me again why you died for me. What we read as sinners, Christ died for us. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from sin. He's the Lord. Isn't that amazing? That, that, that's the best news I know. And now he, he says, be encouraged. Verses 20 uh, through 23. We'll wrap it up. Again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I'll overthrow the thrones of kingdoms. I'll destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I'll overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. And so he addresses the governor. By the way, Bible scholars say this, he's a type of Christ, of the Lord Jesus in latter days because this has a future fulfillment as well. God's going to overthrow Gentile powers. We know that at the end of our story, right? And, and he's going to restore David's line. You say, what is, what's the connection? Zerubbabel was part of David's line. Here's what's so fascinating. If you, if you look it out, you can look at it later. We go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 12, and, and you see in the genealogies. It's helpful to look at genealogies. Every one of those names is there for a reason. And what you see is... Uh, that uh, Zerubbabel was the last person to be in both the line of Mary and the line of Joseph. So he was in the ancestry of Jesus uh, through Mary and the, the blood lineage of Jesus, but he was also part of the legal lineage of Jesus through the bloodline of Joseph. Isn't that fascinating? And so um, I don't mean to be overly, you know, get in the weeds too much, but these things inspire, it builds my faith when I come across these little truths in Scripture. I'm like, wow, what, 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 do you, what do you know? I mean, there's just every little, you know, jot and tittle, as the Bible says. Every little detail. Every punctuation mark, every name, every person, every, every place, everything. Now, I've chosen you, he said. Do you know the Bible says the same thing with you and me? I chose you. I chose you. And I've appointed you. And God has a purpose for our lives. I just want to leave you with this personal sort of reflection and application and, and assurance, really. And you are part of God's kingdom today if you put your faith in Christ alone. We're saved by grace alone through faith in Christ alone. And you're part of His kingdom. And it's, it's not insignificant. It's not unimportant. No matter how it might appear, be encouraged and get back to the work. If, you, if you've just gotten distracted and you're not really engaged, get back to the work. Don't take that as someone cracking a whip or, or kicking you. It, it's an invitation. It's, it's God saying, hey, i got more for you. Your life isn't over. I told you the story, I think, recently of how the Lord has had to say that to me at certain times in my life when it was really dark, when I was going through cancer and I was feeling sorry for myself. And I'm dying. And the Lord had to tell me often, John, you're not dead yet. <laughs> you know, I get back to the work. I'm doing a work. Well, but I can't preach anymore. I can't, you know, do ministry in church. You're in a hospital. Look around. There's all kinds of people who need saved and need encouraging and need hope. Get back to the work, John. Right? And by the way, let's say I do want to take you home tomorrow. You want to come kicking and screaming? Or do you want to, 
you know, do you want to be busy doing the things of the Lord and absent from the body and present with the Lord and wahoo, you know, and I, I don't want to hang my head in shame, you know, embarrassed because I'm too busy whining and sniveling and feeling sorry for myself, you know. Uh, I was raised by a single mom. I apologize if sometimes I sound a little um, harsh. My wife tells me sometimes, John, you got to be careful. You're so blunt. <laughs> and I know I can be, but I hope you hear my heart. Because uh, it's the way the Lord talks to me sometimes. Um, sometimes it's the way my wife talks to me. And they both love me a lot. And they tell me what I need to hear sometimes. But you know, they're all so full of compassion and mercy. And, and they both have figured out when I, I don't need a kick in the pants, but I just need encouragement. But you know, God doesn't ever contradict himself. There's that perfect balance. Sometimes he's correcting, sometimes he's encouraging. And, uh, and I hope wherever you're at today with the Lord, whatever applies to you, just receive it. Just say, okay, Lord, I hear you. I get you. And, 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 uh, and let him use his word to keep you, to get you on track, to help you see where you've gotten off track, to get you back on track and help you stay on track. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your strong love and the way you are such a faithful father. We love how tender you are and we love how strong you are too. We need both. Help us to be the same way in how we love and serve one another, how we minister to one another. And Lord, we pray at the end of our day, each and every day, we could put our head on the pillow at night knowing that we've been faithful to the work of the Lord. Not to being about our own work, but being about your work. And Lord, we trust that you'll make it so in Jesus' mighty name and for, for your glory alone. And we say together, amen.